Welcome back to an evening of the classics with Ostara, and we've been reading John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath. We're on chapter 13. We should be finishing the chapter. We should be going on to the summary in our next video. I'll lay him out, said Ma, but who's to get supper? Sari Wilson said, I'll get supper. You go right ahead, me and the big girl of yours. We sure thank you, said Ma. Noah, you get into them kegs and bring out some nice pork. Salt won't be deep in it yet, but it'll be right nice eaten. We got a half a sack of potatoes, said Sari. Ma said, give me two half dollars. Pa dug in his pocket and gave her the silver. She found the basin, filled it full of water, and went into the tent. It was nearly dark in there. Sari came in and lighted a candle and stuck it upright in a box, and then she went out. For a moment, Ma looked down at the dead old man, and then in pity she tore a strip from her own apron and tied up his jaw. She straightened his limbs, folded his hands over his chest. She held his eyelids down and laid a silver piece on each one. She buttoned his shirt and washed his face. Sari looked in, saying, Can I give you any help? Ma looked slowly up. Come in, she said. I like to talk to you. That's a good girl, big girl you got, said Sari. She's right in peeling potatoes. What can I do to help? I was going to wash Grandpa all over, said Ma, but he got no other clothes to put on. And of course your quilt's spoiled. Can't never get the smell of a death from a quilt. I seen a dog growl and shake at a mattress my Ma died on. That was two years later. We'll wrap him up in your quilt. We'll make it up to you. We got a quilt for you. Sarah said, you shouldn't talk like that. We're proud to help. I ain't Felt so safe in a long time. People needs to help. Ma nodded. They do, she said. She looked long into the old whiskery face with its bound jar and silvery eyes shining in the candlelight. He ain't gonna look natural. We'll wrap him, wrap him up. The old lady took it good. Why, she's so old, said Ma. Maybe she don't even rightly know what happened. Maybe she won't really know for quite a while. Besides us folks, takes a pride in holding in. My pa used to say, anybody can break down. It takes a man not to. We always try to hold in. She folded the quilt neatly about Grandpa's legs and, round, and around his shoulders. She brought the corner of the quilt over his head like a cowl and put it down over his face. Sari handed her half a dozen big safety pins, and she pinned the quilt neatly and tightly about the long package. And at last she stood up. It won't be a bad burying, she said. We got a preacher to see him in, and his folks is all around. Suddenly she swayed a little, and Sari went to her and steadied her. It's sleep, Ma said in a shamed voice, tone. No, I'm all right. We've been so busy getting ready, you see. Come out in the air, Sari said. Yeah, I'm all done here. Sari blew out the candle, and the two went out. A bright fire burned in the bottom of the little gulch, and Tom with sticks and wire had made supports from which two kettles hung and bubbled furiously, and a good steam poured out under the lids. Rose of Sharon knelt on the ground out of range of the burning heat, and she had a long spoon in her hand. She saw Ma come out of the tent, and she stood up and went to her. Ma, she said, I got to ask. Scared again? Ma asked, why you can't get through my nine months without sorrow. But will it hurt the baby? Ma said, there used to be a saying, a child born out of sorrow will be a happy child. Isn't that so, Miss Wilson? I heard it like that, said Sari. And I heard the other, born out of too much joy will be a doleful boy. I'm all jumpy inside, said Rose of Sharon. Well, we ain't none of us jumping for fun, said Ma. You just keep watching the pots. On the edge of the ring of firelight, the men had gathered, for tools they had a shovel and mattock. Ma parked on the ground eight feet, Pa parked marked on the ground eight feet long and three feet wide. The work went on in relays. Pa chopped the earth to the mattock and then Uncle John shoveled it out. Al chopped and Tom shoveled. Noah chopped and Connie shoveled, and the whole drove for the work never diminished in speed. The shovels of dirt flew out of the hole in quick spurts. When Tom was, sh was shoulder deep in the rectangular pit, he said, How deep, Pa? 
good and deep, a couple of feet more. You get out now, Tom, and I get that paper rope. Tom boosted himself out of the hole, and Noah took his place. Tom went to Ma, where she tended the fire. We got any paper in pen, Ma? Ma shook her head slowly. No, that's one thing we didn't bring. She looked towards Siri, and the little woman walked quickly to her tent. She brought back a Bible and a half a pencil. Here, she said, there's a clear page in front. Use that and tear it out. She handed back and penciled to Tom. Tom sat down in the fire lake. He squinted his eyes in concentration and at last wrote slowly and carefully on the big on the end paper in big clear letters. This here is William James Joe, died of a stroke. Old, old man. His folks buried him because they got no money to pay for funerals. Nobody killed him, just a stroke, and he died. He stopped. Ma, listen to this here. Here, he read it solely to her. Why, that sounds nice, she said. Can't you stick on something from scripture so it'll be religious? Open up and get a say in something out of scripture. Gotta be short, said Tom. I ain't got too much more left on the page. Sarah said, how about God have mercy on his soul? No, said Tom. Sounds too much like he was hung. I'll copy something. He turned the pages and read, mumbling his lips, saying the words under his breath. Here's a good short one, he said. And Lot said unto them, oh, not so, my lord. Don't mean nothing, said Ma, long as you're going to put one down. It might as well mean something. Sari said, turn to Psalms over further. You can always get something out of Psalms. Tom flipped the pages and looked down the verses. Now here is one, he said. This here is a nice one. Just blowed full of religion. Blessed is he who tran transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How's that? That's real nice, said Ma. Put that one in. Tom wrote it carefully. Ma rinsed and wiped a fruit jar, and Tom screwed the lid down tight on it. Maybe the preacher ought to write, wrote it, he said. Ma said, no, the preacher wasn't no kin. She took the jar from him and went to the dark tent. She unpinned the covering and slipped the fruit jar in under the thin, cold hands and pinned the comforter tight again, and then she went back to the fire. The men came from the grave, their faces shining with perspiration. All right, said Pa. He and John and Noah and Al went into the tent, and they came out carrying the long pinned bundle between them. They carried it to the grave. Pa leaped into the hole and received the bundle in his arms and laid it gently down. Uncle John put out a hand and helped Pa out of the hole. Pa asked, How about Grandma? I'll see, Ma said. She walked to the mattress and looked down at the old woman for a moment. Then she went back to the grave. Sleeping, she said. Maybe she'll hold it against me, but I ain't gonna wake her up. She's tired. Pa said, Where's at that preacher? We ought to have a prayer. Tom said, I seen him walking down the road. He don't like to pray no more. Don't like to pray? No, said Tom. He ain't a preacher no more. He figures it ain't right to fool people acting like a preacher when he ain't a preacher. I bet he went away so nobody wouldn't ask him. Casey had come quietly near and he heard Tom speaking. I didn't run away, he said. I'll help you folks, but I won't fool you. Pa said, won't you say a few words? Ain't none of our folks ever been... Buried without a few words, I'll say him, said the preacher. Connie led Rose of Sharon to the graveside. She reluctant. You got to, Connie said. It ain't decent not to. It'll just be a little. The firelight fell on the group people, showing their faces and their eyes, dwindling on their dark clothes. All the hats were off now. The light danced jerking over the people. Casey said, it'll be a short one. He bowed his head. And the others followed his lead. Casey said solemnly, This here old man just lived a life and just died out of it. I don't know whether he was good or bad, but that don't matter much. He was alive, and that's what matters. And now he's dead, and that don't matter. Heard a fella tell a poem one time, and he says, All that lives is holy. Got to thinking, and pretty soon it means more than the whole the words say, it says. And I wouldn't pray for an old fella that's dead. He's all right. He's got a job to do, but it's all laid out for him, and there's only one way to do it. But us, we got a job to do, and there's a thousand ways, and we don't know which one to take. If I was to pray, I'd, it'd be for the folks that don't know which way to turn. Grandpa here, he got the easy straight, <clears throat> and now cover him up and let him get to his work. He raised his head. 
Pa said, Amen, and the others muttered, Amen. Then Maj took the shovel, half filled it with dirt, and spread it gently into the black hole. He handed the shovel to Uncle John, and John dipped, dropped in a shovel full. Then the shovel went from hand to hand until every man had his turn. When all had taken them their duty and their right, Pa attacked the mound of loose dirt and hurriedly filled the hole. The women moved back to the fire to see supper. Ruthie and Winfield watched, absorbed. Ruthie said solemnly, Grandpa's down under there, and Winfield looked at her with horrified eyes, and then he ran away to the fire and sat on the ground and sobbed to himself. Pa half filled the hole, and then he stood panting with the effort while jo Uncle John finished it. And John was shaping up the mount mound when Tom stopped him. Listen, Tom said. If we leave a grave, they'll have it open in no time. We gotta hide it, level her off, and we'll strew dry grass. We gotta do that. Pa said, I didn't think of that. It ain't right to leave a grave unmounted. Can't help it, said Tom. They'd dig him right up, and we'd get it for breaking the law. You know what I get if I break the law? Yeah, Pa said. I forgot that. He took the shovel from John, leveled the ground. She'll sink come winter, he said. Can't help that, said Tom. We'll be a long ways off by winter. Tromp her in good, and we'll strew stuff over her. When the pork and potatoes were done, the family sat beat about on the ground and ate, and they were quiet. Staring into the fire, Wilson tearing a slab of meat with his teeth, sighed with contentment. Nice eating pig, he said. Well, Pa explained, we had a couple of shoats, and we thought we might as well eat them. Can't get nothing for them. When we kind of used to move in, and Ma can set up bread, why, it'll be pretty nice seeing the country and two kegs of pork right in the truck. How long you folks been on the road? Wilson cleared his teeth with his tongue and swallowed. We ain't been lucky, he said. We've been three weeks from home. Why, God Almighty, we aim to be in California in ten days or less. Al broke it. I don't know, Pa. With that load we're packing, we maybe ain't gonna, ain't never gonna get there. Not if there these mountains to go over. They were silent about the fire. Their faces were turned downward, and their hair and foreheads showed in the firelight. Above the little dome of the firelight, the summer stars shone thinly, and the heat of the day was gradually withdrawing. On her mattress away from the fire, Grandma whimpered softly like a puppy. The heads all turned in her direction. Ma said, Rosa Sharon, like a good girl, go lay down with Grandma. She needs somebody now. She's no one now. Rosa Sharon got to her feet and walked to the mattress and lay beside the old woman, and the murmur of their soft voices drifted the fire. Rosa Sharon and Grandma whispered together on the mattress. Noah said, Funny thing is, losing Grandpa ain't made me feel no different than I'd done before. I ain't no sadder than, than I was. It's just the same thing, Casey said. Grandpa in the old place, they was just the same thing. Al said, it's a goddamn shame. He's been talking what he's going to do, how he's going to squeeze grapes over his head and let the juice run on his whiskers and all stuff like that. Casey said, he was fooling all the time. I think he knowed it. And Grandpa didn't die tonight. He died the minute you took him off the place. You sure of that, Pa cried? Why, no. Oh, he was breathing, Casey went on, but he was dead. He was that place, and he note, note it. Uncle John said, did you know he was a dying? Yeah, said Casey, I note it. John gazed at him, and a horror grew in his face. And you didn't tell nobody? What good, Casey asked. We we might have did something. What? I don't know, but. No, Casey said, you couldn't have done nothing. Your way was fixed, and Grandpa didn't have no part in it. He didn't suffer, not after the first thing this morning. He's just staying with the land. He couldn't leave it. Uncle John sighed deeply. Wilson said, We had to leave my brother Will. The heads turned toward him. Him and me had forties side by side. He's older than me. Neither one ever drove a car. Well, we went in and we sold everything. Will, he bought a car and they gave him give him a kid to show him how to use it. So the afternoon before we're going to start, Will and Aunt Minnie go a practice practicing. Will, he comes to a bend in the road, and he yells, whoa, and yanks back, and he goes through a fence, and he yells, whoa, you bastard, and tromps down in the gas and goes over into a gulch, and there he was, didn't have nothing more to sell, and didn't
have no car. But it were his own damn fault, praise God. He's so damn mad he won't come along with us. Just sit there a cussing and a cussing. What's he gonna do? I don't know. He's too mad to figure. And we couldn't wait. Only had $85 to go on. We couldn't set and cut it up. But we ended up anyways. Didn't go a hundred miles, went mile and a tooth in the rear end bust and cost $30 to get her fixed. And there we got to get a tire and then a spark plug cracked and Sari got sick. Had to stop 10 days and now the goddamn car is bust again and money's getting low. I don't know when we'll ever get to California if I could only fix a car, but I don't know nothing about cars. Al asked importantly, what's the matter? Well, she just won't run. Starts and farts and stops. In a minute, she'll start again. And then before you can get her going, she peters out again. <coughs> Runs a minute in, then dies. Yes, sir, as I can't keep her going, no matter how much gas I give her, it got worse and worse, and now I can't get her a moving tall. Al was very proud and very mature then. I think you got a plug gas line. I'll blow her out for you. And Pa was proud too. He's a good hand with a car, Pa said. Well, I'll sure thank you for a hand. I sure will. Makes a fella kind of feel like a little kid when he can't fix nothing. When we get to California, I aim to get me a nice car. Maybe she won't break down. Pa said, when we get there, getting there's the trouble. Oh, but she's worth it, said Wilson. Why, I seen handbills how they need folks to get picked fruit and good wages. Why, just think how it's going to be under them shady trees of picking fruit and taking a bite every once in a while. Why, hell, they don't care how much you eat because they got so much. And with them, good wages, maybe a fella can get himself a little piece of land and work out for a ca extra cash. Why, hell, in a couple of years, I bet a fella could have a place of his own. Pa said, we seen them handbells. I got one right here. He took his purse and from it took a folded orange handbell. In black type, it said, pea pickers wanted in California. Good weed wages all season. 800 pickers wanted. Wilson looked at it curiously. Why, that's the one I seen. The very same one. You suppose maybe they got all 800 already? Pa said, this is just one little part of California. Why, that's the second... Biggest state we got. Suppose they didn't get all them 800. There's plenty of places here. I'd rather pick fruit anyways. Like you says, under them trees and picking fruit. Why, even the kids like to do that. Suddenly Al got up and walked to the Wilson's touring car. He looked in it for a moment and then comes back and sat down. You can't fix her tonight, Wilson said. I know. I'll get to her in the morning. Tom had watched his young brother carefully. I was thinking something like that myself, he said. Noah asked, what you two fellas talking about? Tom and Al were silent, each waiting for the other. You tell them, Al said finally. Well, maybe it's no good. And maybe it ain't the same thing, Al's thinking. Here she is, anyways. We got a overload, but Ma and Mrs. Wilson ain't. If some of us folks could ride with them and take some of their light stuff in the truck, we wouldn't break no springs and we couldn't get up hills. And me and Al both knows about a car, so we could keep that car rolling. We'd keep together on the road and it'd be a good for everybody. Wilson jumped up. Why, sure. Why, we'd be proud. We cer certainly would. You hear that, Sari? It's a nice thing, said Sari. Wouldn't it be burden on you folks? No, by God, said Pa. Wouldn't it be no burden at all? Wouldn't be helping. You'd be helping us. Wilson settled back uneasily. Well, I don't know. What's the matter, don't you want to? Well, well, you see, I only got about $30 left, and I won't be no burden. Ma said, you won't be no burden. Each will help each, and we'll get to Cal all get to California. Sari Wilson helped lay Grandpa out, and she stopped. The relationship was plain. Al cried. That car will take six easy. Say me to... To drive on Ro and Rosa Sharon on Connie and Grandma. Then we take the big light stuff and pile here her on the truck. And we'll trade off ever so often. 
He spoke loudly for a, lot, for a load of worry was lifted from him. He smiled shyly and looked down to the ground. Pa fingered the dusty earth with his fingertips. He said, Ma favors a white house with oranges growing around. There's a big picture on a calendar she's seen. Sari said, if I get sick again, you got to go on and get there. We ain't a-going to burden. Ma looked carefully at Sari, and she seemed to see, for the first time, the pain-tormented eyes and the face that was haunted and shrinking with pain. And Ma said, we going to see you get through. You said yourself, you can't let yourself get unwanted. Sari studied her wrinkled hands in the firelight. We got to get some sleep tonight. She stood up. Grandpa, it's like he's dead a year, Ma said. The families moved lazily to their sleep, yawning luxuriously. Ma sloshed the tin plates off a little and rubbed the grease free with a flour sack. The fire died down and the stars descended. Few passenger cars went by on the highway now, but the transport trucks thundered by at intervals and put little earthquakes in the ground. In the ditch, the cars were hardly visible under the starlight. A tired dog howled at the service station down the road. The families were quiet and sleeping, and the field mice grew bold and scampered out about among the mattresses. Only Sari Wilson was awake. She stared into the sky and braced her body firmly against pain. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit like, subscribe, comment below, and stay tuned for chapter 14 and the summary to chapter 13 of Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath.